Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. We've decided to revisit the centre of the region and find some hidden gems, places that are not quite so famous, but still just as beautiful. A short journey up the valley brings us to the little village of Temple Guiting. As we mentioned in Guiting Power, or Lower Guiting, the name probably originates from the Old English word for gushing. The village sits on the river Windrush, albeit quite close to its source. But the temple part of the name relates to the fact that this land and manor belonged to the Knights Templar. In the middle of the 12th century, the preceptory of Temple Guiting was founded. It was a medieval monastic house funded by donations of land and money from the Norman families of Lacey and Waterville. Some of you may remember the family name of Lacey coming up in our recent travels around this western edge of the Cotswolds. The Weems family at Stanway, no more than a couple of miles from here, is descended from the Laceys. The Knights Templar were established in 1119 and given papal recognition in 1129. It was a Catholic medieval military order started by a small number of mainly French knights resolved to protect pilgrims to the sacred sites in the Levant, the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The knights took a vow of poverty and chastity and basing themselves in Jerusalem they dedicated their lives to the protection of the wandering pilgrims from all over the Christian world. In 1120, King Baldwin II, King of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, gave the Knights Templar his palace, the former Aqsa Mosque, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem to use as their headquarters. This building was commonly referred to as the Temple of Solomon, and so the military brotherhood became known as the Templars. Initially, the Brotherhood was seen as a kind of offshoot of the Cistercian Order, and they wore the distinctive Cistercian white hooded mantle over their armour. But soon, they identified themselves by adding a red cross, and this red cross on a white background became their mark, closely associated in the minds of my generation at least, with the Crusades of the 12th and 13th centuries. Huge donations came into the Brotherhood as they grew, and the Templars became wealthy and powerful, providing one of the very first international banking services to the nations of the world, as well as the military support for the religious wars. The Preceptory of Guiting was a kind of regional office of the London arm of the Templars. Unfortunately, the Templars became a little too powerful and influential for the likings of the European rulers, particularly the French king, and eventually they were accused, almost certainly fallaciously, of all kinds of infamy, and finally disbanded at the beginning of the 14th century. The brothers were all arrested, many tortured and executed, and the preceptor of Guiting, John de Coningston, was sent to the monastery at Worcester, where his keep was paid for from the income from guiding. The church in this village is an unusual building. In about 1740, a Dr George Torbert was appointed to the incumbency and he left his mark in more ways than one. He spent a thousand pounds beautifying the church according to the taste of his day and as Evans relates, it remains an astonishing example of the enormities which the taste of the day was capable of. He really hated this church. And it's true that traditionalists are somewhat mortified by what's been done here, but the passing of the years has perhaps made it less horrific to the eyes of the 21st century. The font is a pretty example of the octagonal fonts we've seen often before, and it boasts an engraved glass cover by Bryant Fedden, made in 1974. The pulpit is 18th century, made of oak and finely carved and inlaid. There's a huge and elaborate plaster royal arms of George III 
hanging under the 18th century tower arch. And there are three good panels of stained glass from around 1500. The other nine of this group of stained glass panels is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. When Evans came through here in 1905, he writes of a village more peaceful than which it would be hard to find. There is no inn, the great house is untenanted, the children are at school and their elders in the fields. The cottage doors stand open, and it is with some difficulty that you at last come across an inhabitant who encourages you to proceed another mile on your journey to the plough at Ford. The plough is a great pub, where Ross and I have eaten several times, in the heart of horse racing territory, owned by the local Donington Brewery, and Evans relates the sign on the gable of the building, which read, in those days, Ye weary travellers that pass by, with dust and scorching sunbeams dry, or be he numbed with snow and frost, with having these bleak Cotswolds crossed, step in and quaff my nut-brown ale, bright as rubies mild and stale, twill make your lagging trotters dance, as nimble as the sons of France. And then ye will own, ye men of sense, that ne'er was better spent six pence. <laughs>